All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for Just a reminder, this meeting is being held hybrid and is also being recorded. Uh, if anyone who's joining us virtually has any questions uh, during public comment time, just raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, with that, uh, before we get started, I'd like to announce that the board had two executive sessions this month, one on June 2nd uh, to discuss administrative personnel and one uh, today on June 13th for police personnel discussion um, and potential litigation, right? We did talk about that a little bit. Um, with that, I'd like to move to the first thing on the agenda, and that is uh, approving the minutes of May 9th, 2022. Is there a motion to approve the Board of Supervisors May 9th, 2022 minutes? So moved. A second. All in favor, oh, public comment, or no, board comment, my bad. <laughs> Any comment? Public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next up are the reports. Uh, first is the police chief. Uh, thank you and good evening. For the month of May 2022, the Euclid Township Police Department officers documented 1,137 entries in the police department call reporting system. During the reporting period, the officers issued 95 traffic citations, they investigated 30 motor vehicle crashes, and they arrested 11 individuals. Additionally, for the month of May, Sergeant McBride partnered with the Pennsylvania State Police troopers from Troop J to conduct a motor carrier detail at the way station. During the detail, 425 commercial motor vehicles were weighed and five were found to be overweight. Uh, 48 motor carrier inspections were also performed with numerous violations reported. Those violations contributed to 20 commercial motor vehicles being placed out of service along with three drivers. During the reporting period, Sergeant McBride conducted two commercial vehicle inspections during his normal work days, resulting in several violations and one commercial motor vehicle being placed out of service. Uh, year to date, the officers have documented 5,223 calls in our call reporting system. They've arrested 56 individuals. They've issued 470 traffic citations, 116 written warnings, and they've investigated 153 motor vehicle crashes, and they've weighed 578 commercial motor vehicles. I'm also happy to report that uh, we had no Narcan's administration this month, and as I was looking back, uh, I don't believe we have had any Narcan administrations for the year so far, which is great. Okay, thank you. Treasurer. Good evening. Uh, through the month of May in the general fund, we have collected just over 50% of our budgeted revenues and have spent just under 39% of our budgeted expenditures. Okay, thank you. Next up, public works. Thank you. For the month of May, the daily average flow of the downtown treatment plant was 1,698,750 gallons per day, and there were no new connections to either the DARA or the Eagleby Wastewater Treatment Plant. For the month of May, the township received 2.67 inches of rain, uh, with the normal being 4.4. Uh, we are, if you can believe it, in May we were still minus one inch for the year. Um, the PLC project has, at the Eagleby Treatment Plant has reached substantial completion and is now operating um, as designed. The sewer division cleaned and televised approximately 1,500 feet of storm pipe for the 2023 paving program, uh, which we try to get ahead of uh, to get the, pipe, the pipes uh, repaired in, in advance of, of each paving program. Uh, the department responded to 214 PA1 calls for the month and performed preventative maintenance in accordance with the sanitary sewer system maintenance program. Uh, the streets department was out uh, replacing damaged stormwater pipe on Burdett and replaced um, failing storm pipe on Dover Court and Williamsburg Boulevard. 
Uh, finally, with the department managed the street sweeping program, which was completed last month. Okay, thank you. Fire Marshal. Good evening. Uh, for the month of May, the building department issued 120 permits for construction activities. Total of 113 inspections were conducted, 47 use and occupancy certificates issued, and the fire marshal responded to 24 incidents during working hours. All right, thank you. Lionville Fire Company. Okay, for the month of May, the Lionville Fire Company responded to 68 incidents. Uh, 31 were in Euclid, 18 Upper Euclid, 6 in West Pikeland, and 13 in other municipalities. Uh, year to date, 245. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone here? For, oh, yes, there is someone here from Euclid Ambulance. But to give a report, probably not. Do you have a, oh, you do have the report too? Um, well, we're just, yeah, we'll get through the reports. Okay. Um, so, okay, is there a motion to approve the reports? So moved. Second. Any comment from the board? Public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. The ayes have it, motion passes. Okay, next up uh, under business, the Devon Drive traffic update. We're just putting this on the agenda to keep the public informed on latest traffic issues in the township. That is correct. Um, I wanted to follow up on a conversation that we had at our last board meeting back in May. Uh, the township has been working with the Downingtown Area School District uh, regarding um, potentially putting a school zone on Devon Drive, which has not historically been there. There's one on PA Route 113. Um, however, Devon Drive, which is where a good portion of the school frontage is, is not. So knowing that there's a, a pretty well-utilized park and uh, two rather large schools, both the high school, the elementary school, and the middle school, um, we'll be working with PennDOT to get that permit approved and working with the school district to get the flashers installed. So right now we're trying to distinguish whether or not we need to put a new permit in or if we can work with the existing permit. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any questions about that or is there a comment anyone wants to add? No. Okay, thank you. Next under business, the Euclid Ambulance Funding Formula presentation. That's you, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for giving us some time on your agenda this evening. Um, for the record, I'm Kathy Kazone, Executive Director at Euclid Ambulance. I'm here with Tammy Whiteman, our Chief of Operations. And we just want to talk with you a little bit tonight about um, how we want to consider partnering with all of the communities we serve moving forward. So I know um, Scott met with all the other township managers uh, a couple of months ago um, to sort of review what our proposal was. And one of the requests that came out of that meeting was that we make that uh, presentation in public. So we have a kind of a short presentation before we get there, just for context. First is our mission and vision, which is fairly simple, um, saving lives and educating the community and doing our best to make sure we have a healthy community. The challenges that we are facing increase call volume and Tammy will give you a, a little bit of an update um, on call volume in a, in a minute. Our return on billing, and we have a little bit of a schedule for that and cost of services and infrastructure. So the, our cost of medical equipment, personnel, and like everybody else right now, fuel, particularly for our um, apparatus that are diesel, um, has become a huge issue for us. In fact, we hit the cap on our credit card for fuel and <laughs> had to figure out how to, how to solve that problem. So um, that's a big part of our current mm -hmm. issues. On the next page is just um, a little picture of the population of Euclid Township. And this was based on DVRPC after the last census. I haven't updated yet. Um, and the percent of total call volume um, so you can see in the short green lines where Euclid falls against the entire agency. On the next page, we go a little bit more into billing. So an ALS call is an advanced life support call, and that's 
if someone, if there's a, if there's a heart issue or a respiratory issue that requires a paramedic to be dispatched, that's what we call an ALS call. A BS, BLS call is more, something more like maybe a, a broken arm or a broken leg that doesn't require a medic and treat without transport is generally lift assists, although sometimes there's also refusals to for transportation. So on the high end, our average advanced life support bill is $2,300 plus $14 a loaded mile. And a loaded mile means we can only request reimbursement for the mileage that a patient is actually in the ambulance. So our mileage to a destination after being dispatched and back from the hospital is not reimbursed um, under any situation. Our average return among all of those is $590. That is primarily the result of Medicare and Medicaid. You, we are not allowed to balance bill Medicare and Medicaid members unless sometimes they have supplemental insurance that has a copay or co-insurance and we can bill that. But we are required to take whatever Medicare or Medicaid have allocated based on not sure. <laughs> We have a pretty good collection rate on private insurance, probably about 90, 99%. We have an excellent billing agent. So we're happy about that. So the primary issue here really is Medicare and Medicaid um, and you know, not really covering the rising costs that we're facing. On the next page, just a couple of pretty pictures. Um, on the bottom, the kids in the red shirts, that's a, a little bit of an older picture of our youth group. We're very happy that now that COVID is a little bit more under control, we've been able to reinvigorate our youth group. We now have over 20 participants. Um, and the primary goal of that organization is to instill in the kids the concept of community service. They will have the opportunity to take an EMT class um, and of course, if they pass it, we hope that they'll be part of our volunteer um, crew or perhaps even uh, one, of our, one of our providers. But there many of them have gone on to other careers in healthcare or ancillary to healthcare or medical. So we're, we're excited that we're able to get that back up and running. On the top right corner, <coughs> pardon me, is a picture of our, our former training corner. She, um, she left for a, another job, but we continue to do this work. We partnered with Aiden's Heart Foundation after um, the incident with the young Coatesville football player who suffered a heart event on the field. We have now, we, in partnership with Aiden's Heart Foundation, been to four high schools where we have trained the students and the coaches on how to do um, CPR should something like that happen again. More than I can have so just a couple examples of some of the things that we do for the community outside of our primary purpose, which is to respond to 911 calls. So how do we solve it? Keep going. <laughs> um, we're sort of looking at this as um, sort of the, the four pillars of where our funding comes from. Obviously we have billing, which isn't part of this because it's, it's fee for service, if you will. But we have our annual funding from our municipal, all the municipalities we serve. And again, we thank you for your generosity, um, as well as some other smaller emergency services um, grant funding. Community partnerships that we continue to develop to try to increase the amount of funding we get from community. Nonprofit funding, we are the only agency in Chester County that has a director of development whose primary responsibility is to seek and secure um, grants and she's been fairly successful. The, the issue is there isn't a lot of money out there. And I, and I want to give you one example, which is FEMA. FEMA this year has almost $500 million in grants to give out. Um, they got an extra 90 million out of the ARPA bill. Only 2% of that will go to EMS organizations. The rest of it will go to fire service. Um, the Office of the State Fire Commissioner is the same thing. And even though Governor Wolf allocated another $25 million, which were approved, we don't know how much money that is going to be. But again, it was for all the EMS agencies throughout the state. So our, our initial funding was like seven or $8,000 from the Office of the State Fire Commissioner for this year. 
And then of course, our second biggest revenue line is um, our subscription drive. And that's where residents of our uh, service area have the opportunity to buy what we're calling a subscription. It's like, uh, it's like an insurance policy. It's not tax deductible, but if somebody should require 911 service, we will not balance bill them. So whether they have private insurance um, and you know the, the insurance company only covers X, um, we won't balance bill them for the rest of their sus subscriber. There is a cost to that, of course, but our revenue far outweighs um, the cost. So we also like to encourage anyone who's here and anyone who might be listening, who lives in any one of the townships that we provide service for, when that envelope shows up, um, please try to buy a subscription and whatever else you might want to add to that subscription can be a tax write-off. Um, we issued last year, we're about to mail our subscription this year, next week, I think, um, to over 25,000 households, and we only have about 3,500 subscribers. So um, it's not fabulous. We keep trying. Uh, we also had, um, we had a, a designer bag bingo first time around was fairly successful. We raised about $5,000 net. So given that that was our first time, we were pretty happy. I don't recall seeing a whole lot of you men there, but, um, <laughs> we are also having uh, a fairly large event on August 27th. That'll be a car show combined with a health and safety fair. So similar to what we did on our premises last year in September, um, but we're adding a uh, car show to it and there'll be all kinds of other events happening, possibly another bingo that might be like tools or meat or something like that. So <laughs> seriously, <laughs> apparently there is a thing called meat bingo. <laughs> so, <laughs> meat, she said meat. So I thought, okay. All right, next, <laughs> next slide. So this is a graph that I call our tornado graph. <laughs> um, just kind of worked out that way. Um, this is uh, contributions uh, and over call volume over five years and sort of where each municipality stands in the total. You can keep going. The next page is just our names. And then you can keep going. We provided some financials. I wasn't planning on going through them in detail, but you have them. And so mm -hmm. if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, this, I think this, this piece of paper is really important because it shows trends. So keep in mind, the call volume won't tie to the billing because we're, we, we're a cash-based operation. So we record billing probably when the cash comes in, which is generally three to six months after the calls. But I think over the five years, you can, you can see a trend. And the next page shows what our capital requirements are from 21 to 25. And they total right around $1.5 million. We're currently uh, in the process of entering a contract with for three ambulances that we'll purchase over the next three to four years. Um, they promised um, to keep the price flat over that time, but the total for all of them is just under $900,000. Um, traditionally, Euclid has carried very little debt. Um, we are gonna embark on a fundraising campaign, but we have no idea how successful that will be. And so that's probably gonna be added to our debt in addition to the items that we purchased uh, in 21 and 22, the um, roughly $240,000 in stretchers, Lucas devices and monitors. I wanna let Tammy talk about this page. <laughs> So um, we've had an ever increasing call volume. Uh, we hit a high last year at about um, 4,400 calls. Um, we're projecting about 5,000 calls this year. Um, part of that is due to hospital closures. We're picking up an mm. increased call volume. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Tower Health pulled out of Coatesville area mm -hmm. this week. Um, so they will not be providing ALS services in that area. So we'll be pulled probably to cover a lot of our services in this area as they pull 
we actually had a, two calls in Coatesville. We just had another one today. Um, so um, our call volume keeps increasing. Um, with that, of course, comes cost, um, not only with the cost of uh, paying our providers. Um, we're in sort of in a now salary war in EMS because we have very low pool as everyone else does of providers and caregivers. Um, so cost of having those providers, which they deserve every penny of, and it's mm -hmm. been long due, but that of course increases our bottom line as well as the increasing fuel costs when we have to travel as far as Coatesville and back. Um, so um, we are very concerned with that closure of the ALS um, as we get pulled and more likely we'll be covering Downingtown as Downingtown goes to cover Coatesville. Um, so we're working on that and increased staffing. I know the county is looking at that too and the proposals to cover that, that service area. One of the issues we had too was hospital closures this year with Jennersville and Brandywine Hospital closing. Um, so our hospitals have been overwhelmed, which increased our wait times at the hospital. So where traditionally two years ago, we were waiting 20 minutes to offload a patient. I, my crews can wait up to three hours to offload a patient. Um, so that is also an increasing issue, um, which has gotten better over the last months, but just like EMS, the hospitals are having staffing crisis needs too. Um, so it's a full circle effect. So as you can see uh, year to date, you're at 689. So you're pretty neck and neck with Upper Euclid um, at this time. As you know, the traffic flow through here has increased our traffic issues as citations go up and accidents go up. Um, so we're seeing that effect too, especially with the hotels, which have, the situation has gotten better, but we still have a lot of people housing in the hotels who are a lower payer mix. Thank you. I also you. would like to point out just really quickly, um, you know, five months of the year is, I don't know, 41.67% of the year. In total, we're already at 47% of where we were last year. Mm -hmm. So we're fairly confident in our estimate of meeting or exceeding 5,000 calls this year. So the last page, ta-da. <laughs> this is a proposed funding formula. So before I, I go through this really quickly, I just wanna say that this is a, the financial challenges that we are facing is not unique to Euclid, nor is it unique to our neighboring agencies. And frankly, it's a problem in the entire country. Um, uh, I know there are some, there is some legislation kind of bouncing about in Harrisburg, but honestly, from what I've seen, it's like little spits in the bucket of where we really need to be. Um, so we know that we're gonna uh, need some additional help from our municipalities, but we also know that, you know, we're, we have a responsibility as well to do whatever we can to try to raise as much funds as we can. But as I said before, um, there are limited opportunities, but we keep, we keep trying. So um, last year was the first year, to my knowledge, that Euclid Ambulance ever sent an official ask to any of our municipalities. In the past, um, the agency had pretty much relied on the generosity of the municipalities and you know whatever um, they could afford in their budget is, um, is, what they, is what they were grateful for. For 2022, I did make official asks more or less based on uh, what, the, what the gives, what the, sorry, what the, what the funding was in 2021. Um, I did make a couple of adjustments in some of our larger territories um, where I thought it was a reasonable ask. But the reality is if we had asked fully what we would have needed between our budgeted operating loss and our capital purchase requirements for this year, we would have needed to ask for $377,000. So my then I said to myself, so what is the most realistic way to expect municipalities to figure out how to do this? What is quote unquote fair? Um, and so with Tammy's help, I reached out to one of the chiefs in Southern Chester County who actually enacted this specific formula with 13 of his municipalities. And I thought, well, if he could get 13 of them agree, maybe we could get eight to agree. Um, so it's, it's a blended 
uh, formula and it is made up of uh, population, which would be updated with the new census, um, taxable parcels and call volume. And what that does is it, you know, if we were to do something just by call volume, it would sort of leave out the cost of readiness and the cost of capital, right? So we may never have a call. I still have, you know, crews 24 seven. So there, there is a cost to readiness. Um, and so that's where, when you start to bring in the population and the other taxable parcels, I think you start to get a better, um, it's a better mix, I think. So in this particular scenario, um, what we would have asked Euclid Township for if this were the formula was $105,000, which would have been $75,000 more than we asked for. So our ask this evening, as we've been, by the end of June, I will have visited, we will have visited every municipality, um, is to get some agreement, whether it's you know tonight or some other time, on being part of that group of municipalities that agrees on a funding formula um, so that we can sort of put that piece of it to bed um, and then start figuring out, you know, okay, so then what, what does the ask look like? I know there also was a request in that meeting to try to phase this in over time. It's something that we're willing to do, but our situation, unless Medicare or Medicaid reimbursements go sky high, isn't really going to get any better. So we can do that. We're happy to do that, um, but I don't think it's going to necessarily change the dy dynamic in the long run. So, did I miss anything? <laughs> that's our presentation, and that's our ask. Does anybody have any questions? Does the board have any questions? I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you. I know that you guys have been through the ringer over the last couple of years with COVID and an already declining volunteer pool. Um, I think you do really great work in our community. I'm familiar mm -hmm. with it myself, and I see a lot of great content floating out there with the um, programming that you offer and your initiatives, and I think that you're really an asset to our community that most people probably don't think about until they need it. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Right, we appreciate that. Thank you. Do and a lot of people also think we're township employees, by the way. <laughs> yeah. We show up, they're like, oh, we love you, Glen Township employees. That's very nice. We'll let them know. <laughs> do, do what You said we're the last of the, of the group? No. Is, no, no by the end of the month. I will oh, by the end of the month. I'm sorry, I missed that. All right. Okay. I, I think it's reasonable. I think it's reasonable. Um, I think it's smart that we're no longer just basically picking a number out of a, of a hat and having some kind of guidance of like what you need compared to what, what you're getting. And I mean, it is re the responsibility of the townships to be able to provide, you know, for the safety of the residents. So this is, this is helpful because it, I think it splits out and at least, you know, someone could quibble on the details, but I think this at least gives us a scope of what the problems that you're facing and what we would need to um, at least be able to help you make whole. So. This is a helpful start, yeah. We appreciate that. And again, this is a, a not even recommended, a suggested formula. Mm -hmm. If the municipalities get together and you all can agree on something different, <laughs> that's, that's fine by me too. Right. It was just, I figured maybe give you some place to start, right. so. Yeah, and there does seem to be a large discrepancy on, oh which townships give how much. And I'm proud that we're giving our ass this year. And I, I understand that um, it's not as much as you guys need, but um, we appreciate the heads up and just getting this conversation going because I agree with Laura and, and Bill that you provide a really important service and um, you know it needs to be funded, so. We have some Thank pretty you. outstanding providers, not yeah. the least of which is our chief, so. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for thank coming you. here. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Next up is on the agenda is awarding the bid for the 2022 road projects. So the bids were due by June 9th at 10 a.m. We did open the bids uh, through pen bid. The township received three bids with the lowest and who were recommending the board award the 
bid to this evening is Miko, Miko Constructors Inc. Um, in the amount of $225,225.70. Okay. Is there a motion to award the bid for the 2022 road projects to Miko Construction Incorporated? So moved. Second. Any questions or comment from the board? Any questions from the public about the bid? I, I yes. Would... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. So this is for our, our annual pacing program. $225,000. Yeah, sure. Um, are there any other comments from the public? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, next up on the agenda is the promotion or permission to re advertise non prevailing wage maintenance paving. So, this section of the bid, we actually did not receive any bids for. So, this is why we're asking the board for permission to re advertise. Um, this is not related to the program, it's maintenance paving that we do throughout the year or related to stormwater projects. You know, a lot of times when the public works department ends the project, it's temporary paved, and then we go back and we do permanent paving. So this is what we're asking for this evening. I don't know why we didn't get any bids, but we're going to look into that and try again. Okay. Is there a motion to re-advertise for non-prevailing wage maintenance paving bids? So moved. I'll second. Any comment? Any comment or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next up on the agenda is permission to advertise a bid for the Ted Jacoma Senior Park. Well, this is actually something fun to talk about, I think. Yes. Um, Parks are much more fun than roads. We, it's been a while since this, this project's been back before the board. Um, we've been talking internally about it a great deal. Um, one second, I'll pull it up. I apologize. This is the best rendition that I could get for this evening. Um, Scott, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you move your microphone closer? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Hello? Is it on? It's on. It's on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. So this, we went through the process with this park and we received a grant um, from the DCED. Um, since going through this process, obviously we lost Ted Jacomas, who was a longtime engineer for the township. Um, the board has decided to name this park since after Ted and all his contributions to the township. Um, I know it's difficult to see what's on the screen right now, but the <laughs> there's going to be a, a great deal of, of amenities specific to um, our older population, um, including bocce ball courts, as you can see here, there's two courts. Um, pickleball, which has just exploded in popularity in the last couple of years here. So um, there's two courts proposed in this plan here. Um, there's also a pavilion and it's, it's, I apologize, it's difficult to see this, but as you go around the ring, there's a uh, walking path as well as exercise stations that ring the, um, both the bocce ball court and the pickleball courts. Um, the, the final amenity is a large swing um, yeah. <laughs> uh, meant for um, older. Uh, I don't want to say adult swings. It's, it's multi generational. You can swing with your grandkids or with your friends. So I, I was hoping to have a, a graphic of that this evening. However, we weren't able to get that for tonight. So um, the amenities that this park offers, you know, when we went through the grant process, it was one of the um, it was said to be one of the first of its kind. So um, we're really excited to be asking the, the board for permission to advertise this this evening. Um, we will keep the public um, up to date as the project moves forward. And I hope to have a better graphic when we come back. <laughs> um, and just to give uh, residents a sort of a frame of reference, this park will be uh, located at the Lionville Park on 113 and Devon Drive there. There's a little extra space sort of near the lower parking lot next to the middle school. Um, just right, so this is currently, it's um, open right now. Um, there's the Hoffaker house and um, it's just south of the parking lot there across from yeah. the wall. Yeah. Um, and I'm super excited to add these amenities for senior citizens um, in our community as a place to like gather, 
get exercise, socialize, um, and be outside. So um, is there a motion to advertise the bid for the Tajukama Senior Park? So moved. And I'll second. Is there any comment from the board or questions? Not from me. Any comment or questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, come on up, Greg. Oh. So um, yeah, it's a, it's not that large, but on 113, um, where the small parking lot is next to there's a ball field next to the middle school. Yeah. Evangelista field. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so we're just making the most of that space um, that's open there. Is another question, Kathy? Yeah, thank you. And um, Ted was involved uh, with the planning of this park when we first started talking about it a couple of years ago with um, Doug Hanley. So um, we miss him dearly, as does do many people in the community. And so we're really, really happy to be able to um, honor him by naming the park after him. Are there any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Next up on the agenda, Jones Pond Park update. So this is not as fun of a conversation <laughs> as I wanted to have. Um, as everyone's aware, we have the Jones Pond Park, which is off of Dallin Forge Road. Um, the pond that's associated with this park has, is a man-made pond. And it, is, it historically drew its water source from the Shimona Creek. Um, because of the increase in significant rain events that we have had, we've started to notice more of an impact to the pond, which is in very close proximity to Shimona Creek. Um, the, I don't wanna call it the final blow, but a, a significant blow occurred during Ida when the pipe that supplied the pond not only washed away, but the creek itself moved, which made it difficult for us to try and reestablish a water source for the pond. Um, the reason I wanted to have this conversation was obviously to let the public know because it, if you go out there today, the water level is starting to drop. Now that does obviously increase every time it rains. But um, what we wanted to discuss this evening was two options that staff has have talked about at a great length um, for the future of the, the pond here. Um, the first option is obviously to go through the maintenance and bring the pond back to its established state. That would involve a great deal of dredging, as well as now having to pump the water from the, from the Shimona Creek to the pond, which is historically had been gravity fed. Um, the other option is to look at decommissioning the pond. Um, the issue that we're concerned about is that as it starts to dry up, the water is getting very shallow. Um, there is impact to the, the aquatic life in the pond. Um, as well as the water starts to heat and is being overflowed back into the Shimona Creek, which is a concern for ecological factors. So not necessarily asking for the board for any kind of decision this evening. Um, however, there is a predicament here with the future of Jones Pond Park. Um, if we were to look at anything other than the, the pond in this location, we would look at, um, obviously we'd work with the Park and Rec Committee, um, as well as the Parks Department, and it is a trailhead to the Struble Trail there in the Euclid Trail. Um, and we could look at possibly expanding on that use there as well and adding additional amenities for that purpose. Um, the reason that there's some level of urgency in this discussion is because as we get into the warmer months, there's a, concern, a pretty decent concern for mosquitoes um, and the issue with the, the fish that are probably not going to be there much longer with the water source being. I want to get all the fishermen out there it's, right it's, away. It's historically been the, the history of the pond is it actually was a fish, fish mm -hmm. farm. Trout farm. Um, 
it's not something that we want to see have this discussion with lose it's been a great asset to the township it's beautiful mm -hmm. you know we have the gazebo right there um we're just facing the realities of even if we went through it we did get a quote for the dredging and reinstallation of, of the, the water source it was around one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. the concern is that we just have another ida event and it washes everything away again mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we spent one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and now we have to go through that again that's not any reason to not consider it. I mean, that certainly is something we should still consider, but mm -hmm. um, it's become quite a dilemma. Okay. To say the least. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for that update. Are there any questions? No. No. Uh, there's a question from the public. Sure. Do you want to come up to the microphone, Art? I've been a resident for over 40 years. I've fished that pond with my son. Mm. Do you know who Jones is? I do not. Jones actually came along with this property when Euclid Township bought it 40 years ago. And in fact, he says his name should be out there on the, the plaque out there. But anyway, <laughs> Jonesy, it was named after him. And uh, I don't think the township has really maintained the pond that much in the 40 years, but then all of a sudden it got flooded out in that big storm and all the dirt went in. And I'm here to ask you to basically dig the pond out and restore it because I understood that you were considering filling it in. That well it was cheaper to fill it in than to fix it. And well, I just think that that's, uh, that shouldn't be done. It should be restored. Um, yeah, well, we are looking at the different options. We, that's why we were talking about this update in public, just to get the options uh, out there. We have not made any decisions yet. Um, and while it's true, it is a uh, financial investment to dredge the pond and get it back up and working again at the risk of it being flooded again with more and more storm events that we've been having. Um, it's also an ecological issue. It's something else we're taking into account. And like I said, there's no decisions that we've made so far about it. Um, but it is, an pro it is a problem because the pond um, warms up so much and then it goes back into the Shimona Creek and affects the wildlife downstream, you know, by having so much warm water going back into the Shimona Creek. So um, there are a lot of factors to consider when making the decision about what to do with the pond because it is man-made and we wanna make sure that we're doing best for the residents who enjoy the pond and also for the, you know, ecological area and, um, you know, the wildlife, so. Um, Have you contacted the residents along there to let them know that there might be a elimination of the pond? Um, we have not contacted the residents, but like I said, this is why we're bringing it up at a public meeting. I mean, the park belongs to all the residents of Euclid Township. So, you know, we're advertising the meetings and hoping that, and feel free to tell your um, neighbors, um, parks and rec meetings are open. I mean, they're open to the public and everyone's welcome to come and join in and express their opinions there as well. So yeah, I, I just happened to find out about it on the side from one of your employees. And that's why that's I'm here great. tonight. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for sharing your... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, she didn't tell me. <laughs> she knows who would have told me. But, um, but um, we'll definitely share updates uh, and no decision has been made yet. So, um, but thank you for coming and sharing your well, feedback. You know, there's, a, there's a lot going on there. Even if you fill it in, you're going to have to come up with some kind of stormwater management mm -hmm. for Absolutely. the increase in surface area, because now there's no runoff that comes out of the pond when it rains. Right, except for the pond. <laughs> the biggest concern it really is leaving right in a like so every time that we have one of these events it, it, there's the threat of that but this is exactly why we wanted to have this discussion this evening was mm -hmm. to get the input from all sides with of the yeah. potential for the, the well i'm going to leave you my name and my address and my phone number and i would like to be included in uh future discussions and stuff about this because i may not you know hear about 
Yeah. Yeah. Our, do you do you have access to the website, our our township website, where we post updates? Yes. Okay. I encourage you to. Yeah. You take. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I was actually a, a township engineer for 30 some years. So I kind of know what's going on with the pond and what needs to be done. So that I would like to be informed okay. and kept it right. up to date. We'd be happy to do that for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public about the Jones Pond Park update? Anyone online? No. All right. Next up on the agenda is resolution 2022 adopting Chester County complete streets policy. Thank you. So the Chester County Planning Commission passed their complete streets policy back in November of 2021. Uh, this was something we had the opportunity to participate in. I sat in on the uh, as a stakeholder for the stakeholder committee for this policy as it went through creation. Um, the resolution itself goes through several aspects of transportation and not just related to automobiles, but investing in things such as um, pedestrian facilities, cycling facilities, and improvement to connections with public transit. So really looking at developments as a complete street rather than just getting cars from A to B, which historically we've tried to incorporate into developments as they come through, but this policy actually specifically gives recommendations to Euclid Township um, for ways that we could incorporate um, information from this policy into our zoning code. So Tara and I have been discussing potential changes based off of you know, our sidewalk standards, our, our bus shelter standards, um, as well as potentially even looking at a study for um, pedestrian connectivity and cycling connectivity. So the, what's before the board this evening is resolution 2022-09. Um, which formally adopts the um, county's policy. And then what we would do from there is kind of incorporate that into our own um, zoning codes and planning practices. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to adopt resolution 2022-09, uh, the Chester County Complete Streets Policy? So moved. I'll second. Is there any comment or question from the board? I have some comments. Sure. Um, so I'm really excited to see this resolution come before the board. I think it has a lot of important components that are um, in need of updating in Euclid Township. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that this, by, ad um, by adopting this resolution and this policy that's been handed down by Chester County, we can kind of use it as a method to move forward with not just multimodal transportation improvements, pedestrian safety improvements, but um, potentially you know, a segue into a better look at traffic connections that we have here, how we can make it safer, how we can make it more accessible. We have a very diverse community that uses different aspects of our transportation system that sorely need to be updated. And so um, I guess, you know, I'm just in support of it and also asking that we not just adopt the resolution, but have a conversation moving forward about a potential study or plan to continue implementing things that are within this plan and also that the community has been bringing to our attention uh, related to traffic. And I would also ask that we could read it. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I just think it's important and I think that the community should know what's in it. And it was a great summary, but I okay. think that I, I'm happy uh, to read it if you want. Or you can read it. I can read it. Thank you. Hopefully I'll be fine. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's a resolution adopting the Chester County Complete Streets policy, whereas the term complete streets describes a comprehensive integrated transportation network with infrastructure and design that allows for safe and convenient travel along and across streets for all users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, persons with disabilities, motorists, movers of commercial goods, users and operators of public transportation, seniors, children, youth, and families. And whereas the vision statement for the Chester County Complete Streets policy is as follows. Roadways in Chester County will meet the mobility needs of all users and provide for all appropriate modes of transportation with an emphasis on safety, equity, and environmental responsibility. And whereas the County of Chester 
Board of Commissioners adopted the Chester County Complete Streets Policy on November 10th, 2021, and encouraged all Chester County municipalities to adopt the same or a similarly effective complete street policy of their own toward accomplishing the Chester County Complete Streets vision. And whereas the Euclid Township Board of Supervisors recognizes that the planning and coordinated development of complete streets infrastructure provides benefits for Euclid Township in the areas of infrastructure cost savings, public health and environmental sustainability. And whereas Euclid Township's comprehensive plan recommends the advancement of multimodal transportation options where transportation improvements should address all potential transportation modes, including vehicular, transit, freight, aviation, bicycle, and pedestrian to, to provide convenient, accessible, safe, and sustainable options for all community members. And whereas the Euclid Township acknowledges the benefits and value for the public health and welfare of reducing vehicle miles traveled and increasing transportation by walking, bicycling, and public transportation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Euclid Township Board of Supervisors does hereby approve and adopts the Chester County Complete Streets policy attached hereto and made part of this resolution. And that said, exhibit is hereby approved and adopted. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, are there any questions or comments from the public about the complete streets resolution? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, that's it for regular business. Uh, we have hearings for ordinances. We'll just go straight through. Nobody needs a break or anything. And just as a reminder, everybody who's here, there are back rooms right down the hall here on the left in case Feel free to, if anyone has to use a restroom, just go ahead and go for it. They're available. Um, okay. Also, Mark Fried is joining us, our solicitor. He's joining us on Zoom. Is Mark there? I'm here. Oh, I'm here. yay. Where is he? I want to see his face. <laughs> Can you? Okay. All right. So... Thank you, Madam Chair. So we actually have four. Oh, I can't hear them. Hmm. Is it, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I need to get closer. Okay. How's that? Good? Set the balance. We good now? Can you hear me? Yeah, test, test. That's, that's better. Great. Okay. So thank you, Madam Chair. We actually have four ordinances um, to have hearings on tonight. So I will start with the first one. Um, the, the first ordinance that uh, will be, the board will be considering is an ordinance amending chapter 265, section 508 of the township ordinance by amending the provisions of section 508.11 pertaining to the requirements governing town center uses. Um, and before I turn it over to Ms. Giordano to, to maybe give a little background, um, I do have a couple of exhibits to uh, put in the records or a few exhibits. Uh, exhibit uh, B1, board exhibit one is the proposed ordinance. Board Exhibit 2 is the Master Plan of Eagle View, dated June 6, 2022. Exhibit B3 is the Public Notice to the Daily Local. Exhibit B4 is Proof of Publication on May 31st, 2022 and June 6, 2022. Exhibit B5 is the Planning Commission Meeting Minutes, dated May 4th, 2022, and exhibit B6 is the Chester County Planning Commission review letter dated June 10th, 2022. So with that, I'll, I, uh, if Mr. Giordano wants to give a little background explaining why the board is uh, being asked to do this. Yep, so if you recall um, back when the Hankin Group came through their conditional use process for uh, Town Center 2, one of the conditions of their 
decision was that there be no more town centers within the Eagle View development. Um, they did submit a master plan, which is exhibit B2, um, which designates uh, town center, town center two, plan life care facility, residential area, as well as an office park portion. Um, so this ordinance pretty much just solidifies that there will be no more town centers within Eagle View based on that master plan that was submitted in 2021. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you um, to ask for public comment and a vote. Okay. Are there any comments or questions from the board? No. Nope. Are there any comments or questions from the public regarding the town center uh, ordinance? No. And I'm going to go ahead and put it to a vote. All in favor? Uh, aye. Oh. Aye. Well, sorry, hold on. Is there a motion to approve ordinance 2022 yeah. town center amendment ordinance? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, so we will close the record on the town center ordinance and open the record on the lighting ordinance. Um, so this is a um, hearing on ordinance uh, amending the Euclid Township Zoning Ordinance of 2013, Chapter 265, Section 615, to designate the correlated color temperature for LED sources. Uh, and again, before I turn it over, there are a few exhibits. Um, there is the proposed ordinance as exhibit board one. Exhibit board two is the public notice, the daily local. Exhibit B3 uh, is the proof of publication on May 31st, 2022 and June 6th, 2022. Exhibit board four is the Planning Commission meeting minutes dated 5 4 2022, uh, May 4th, 2022. And exhibit B5 is the Chester County Planning Commission review letter dated June 10th, 2022. So I don't know, Ms. Giordano, if you have any comments regarding this. Uh, yes. So this ordinance. Um... <laughs> amends two sections of our lighting um, ordinance based on recommendation from our lighting consultant and the changes um, to LED use being more predominant now. So section 615.3B3 um, was just revised to incorporate um, six watt LED uh, when dealing with um, full cut off and fully shielded lights within the township. Um, section 615.3C11 is a brand new section uh, that deals with the correlated color temperature, um, not to exceed 3000 Kelvin units. Uh, it can the township can permit up to 4000 K units uh, if possible, or, you know, if, we feel it's necessary in certain instances, uh, sometimes with lighting, um, sign lighting, uh, depending on what they're actually proposing. Um, this requirements also for existing luminaries or any that are to be converted with LED sources. Um, I should have mentioned in the last ordinance as well, um, this did go in front of the planning commission and they did make a recommendation in favor of as it's drafted. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Mrs. Giordano. Is there a motion to approve ordinance 2022-03, the lighting ordin ordinance update? So moved. Second. Is there any comment or question from the board? No. Nope. Any comment or questions from the public? Yes. You can you... Uh, these are for uh, downward facing lights, um, specifically for um, like fully shielded cutoff lights. 
you need a name, a name, your name, please. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the public? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. So we'll close the, the record on the lighting ordinance and uh, open the record on the next hearing, uh, which is uh, on an ordinance amending the Euclid Township Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance of 2013 as amended by amending section 602.8.F and replacing appendices A7 and A7.1 with a new appendix A7, uh, which will be um, encompass A7.1 to A7.8, uh, which is attached uh, to the order. And turning it over, uh, a few exhibits. We have uh, exhibit board one is the proposed ordinance. Mr. Freed, sorry yeah. to interrupt. There's some background noise happening. I think something's brushing against your microphone. Oh. Not sure. Maybe papers or something. Better? Yeah, thank you. All right, Sorry. thanks. So we have um, exhibit board one, which is the proposed ordinance. Exhibit board two is appendix A, recommended plant species list. Exhibit B3 is the public notice to the daily local. Exhibit B4 is the proof of publication uh, that ran on May 31st, 2022 and June 6th, 2022. Exhibit B5 is the Planning Commission meeting minutes dated May 4th, 2022. And Exhibit B6 is the Chester County Planning Commission review letter dated June 10th, 2022. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Giordano. So as you are aware, we hired a landscape architect this year and have been working with him uh, to incorporate the use of more native plants within Euclid Township. So in revising this ordinance, um, section F, 602.8F deals with the general landscaping requirements. Um, it also designates the minimum lot size of plantings, the number of plantings um, based on shade trees, flowering trees, evergreen trees, shrubs. And then the appendix A7 also kind of separates street trees, shade trees, uh, native shrubs, evergreen trees, native plants for wet soils, um, native wildflowers for wet soils. So all of the native plantings are in bold in the new appendix A7. Um, the planning commission, again, was in favor of this ordinance as well as the county planning commission. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to approve ordinance 2022-04, the landscaping ordinance? So moved. Second. Is there any board comment? I'm very excited to see this native list incorporated. Um, I just think it is gonna go a long way towards Euclid Township's commitment to biodiversity and improving our ecological spaces. And um, I'm really excited to have this out there as a kind of template and example for uh, our, our neighboring communities to continue implementing more native plantings and uh, contributing positively to an, our environment that way. Thank you. Any other board comment? Any comment from the public or questions? Positive comment. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, so now we will close the record on the, the native species ordinance and open the record on the final ordinance for this evening, which is uh, an ordinance amending Euclid Township Ordinance of 2013, Chapter 265, definitions and sections 501, 502, and 503. 
pertaining to chickens and chapter 87 to allow for the amendments and additions related to the raising and keeping of chickens. Um, there are um, a number of exhibits. Um, exhibit board one is the proposed ordinance. Probably make the noise again. Uh, exhibit B2 is the public notice to the daily local. Exhibit B3 is the proof of publication on May 31st, 2022 and uh, June 6th, 2022. Exhibit B4 is the planning commission meeting minutes dated May 4th, 2022. And exhibit B5 is the draft planning commission meeting minutes dated June 1st, 2022. And on uh, May 4th, 2022, the uh, Planning Commission asked that the ordinance be brought back to them in June. And on June 1st, 2022, uh, it, there was a three to two vote, three uh, against uh, recommending approval and two for recommending approval. And again, I will turn it over to Ms. Giordano. Okay, so <laughs> this ordinance has been a work in progress for quite some time. Um, what we're doing here is actually taking the four acre minimum lot size out of our zoning ordinance and making a standalone backyard chicken ordinance. Um, this is for non-commercial use only, strictly for residential purposes. Um, no roosters will be permitted for any property. Uh, what we are proposing is a minimum lot size of 18,000 square foot lots be allowed to have three chickens, 22,000 square foot lots be allowed four chickens, 30,000 square foot lots, six chickens, one acre lots can have eight chickens, and then two acre lots could have 10. Uh, setbacks for a chicken coop must be not less than 50 feet from a neighboring dwelling and must still comply with all of the zoning requirements for that zoning district, uh, similar to a shed setback uh, for the structure. All of the chickens would need to be enclosed in the structure completely. Uh, we are requiring a minimum chicken coop be not less than one square foot per chicken, but then the total uh, chicken run or pen provide for not less than four square foot per chicken to be able to run. Um, there are some requirements that would be required for the property owners. They would need to apply for a zoning permit um, and they would need to indicate you know, the size and location of the coop on their property, the number of chickens they're intending to keep, how they're going to deal with waste collection and removal, um, and then also provide either a course of completion certification that they know how to raise backyard chickens, or we're working on a best practices guidelines checklist that they would be able to submit with their permit application. That is pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> as Mark had said, it was at the Planning Commission uh, twice. I would just also like to note that we only did have five voting members at the Planning Commission meeting um, in June. So we normally have seven, mm -hmm. which is why it was a three to two vote. Um, I did not hear back from the county mm. on their review of our ordinance. Okay. Thank you. Um, before we ask for public comment or questions, I'll ask, uh, is there a motion to approve ordinance 2022-05, the backyard chicken ordinance? So moved. A second. Uh, is there any comment from the board? Everybody's looking at me. No, well, I, I can mean, start. I yeah, comment. go ahead. You start, Bill. Well, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, I know we had a negative recommendation, negative vote from our planning commission. But I, I think everyone on, or most people, both on the planning commission and, and in general, 
are in agreement that your existing ordinance of four acres is probably excessive for um, restricting the, uh, the possession of backyard chickens. Um, I think everyone's in agreement. Well, meant, most people would be in agreement that we could probably go much lower than that. And then it's just a question of, of where do you draw the lines? And I know some people want to draw the lines very, very small. <laughs> and other, <laughs> others, uh, you know, I know, that, I know other people don't, you know, don't really want chickens in, in smaller lots. And I think, you know, I think that's fine. I think, you know, people can disagree. I don't think there's anything, I don't think bad people don't like chickens and good people like chickens, but I think we've presented a plan here that has, um, you know, a reasonable ability for most residents to have some level of backyard chickens, um, but also doesn't infringe on the, you know, comfort of their, of their neighbors. I think, you know, when I think of the, you know, we have dogs that, that, you know, people tolerate neighbors dogs and that may not may not particularly like dogs and i don't see this being any more burdensome than that in any in any respect and i think they're quieter in many cases but um so i'm i'm inclined to to support this ordinance um and uh, i think it'd be good for you know i don't think it's going to be you know twenty thousand family members and chickens i think there's gonna be a reasonable number so i don't think we'll be infested with in fact, not infested, inundated with chickens, I think, but I think uh, some people will, will will enjoy it. So I'm inclined to support it. Okay. Are there any other board member want to comment? Yes. <laughs> um, I want to thank the staff for the research that went into this, as well as the community members that brought an enormous amount of data and research uh, to our table to look at. Uh, I haven't been here for very long, but I can say with certainty that I'm fully confident that this has been well thought out by the staff, by the community, by all of our commissions. And we've kind of reached the point where we've talked about everything there is to talk about and I'm ready to move forward. Um, as Bill stated, I'm aware that this is a very contentious issue in the community. There's strong feelings on both sides, uh, but I think there's something to be said for um, the freedom of people to have some food security, to have this community building um, act in their families and to share with their neighbors and their communities. And I can hope that as a community, we all work together and care for our neighbors and are thoughtful about how we go about our daily business, whether it involves chickens or dogs or whatever else. Um, and I'm just really appreciative of all the thought and research that has gone into this from all sides. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I would like to echo um, both Bill and Laura's comments. And I definitely appreciate all the work that Tara Giordano has put into this chicken ordinance. Uh, Laura even brought a little chicken over there for her desk to <laughs> celebrate. Um, but um, I think this ordinance at this point is in a very, this draft is in a very good place uh, with, you know, the ability for lots of people to have chickens and with also just enough regulations so that they're kept humanely and um, are not, don't become a nuisance for neighbors. And I have faith in the public of Euclid Township to keep, you know, beautiful backyards and chickens uh, very nicely. So, um, I support this ordinance as well, and I'm glad that we're voting on it tonight. Uh, is there any question or comment from the public regarding the chicken ordinance? Just please state your name for the court reporter. Hi, Kathy Sotak, and I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. I want to say thank you to the township staff and Tara um, for all the work. And um, all three of you actually stole all my public comments that I want to make. Um, thank you for your trust in residents, um, for the data-driven approach. And yeah, at the end of the day, um, I think this will just be great for, uh, for the community members that want to have chickens. Um, it is a little bit of an investment. So um, I, don't, I think you're right that it's not going to be uh, 20,000 residents um, choosing this. But I just want to say thank you uh, for all the hard work. And um, Yay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment regarding the chicken ordinance? Is there anyone online raising their hand, Scott? Uh, hey, uh, it's Doug Collins online. Okay, go ahead, Doug Collins. Um, what, I'm just, just wondering why we wouldn't follow the recommendation of the planning committee on this. 
why are we not recommend we following the, is the recommendation of the planning committee yeah why wouldn't we follow the the people who we pay well not pay but that we we've, we've gotten place to make sure that the planning and and the process is followed and and we're not following their recommendation um i would just say that yes there was vigorous debate over a couple of meetings at the planning commission um and there it was a mixed vote all members of the planning commission weren't there that night to vote there were two members that uh were out that evening um and so i mean i personally believe that you know there's enough support for this ordinance to feel comfortable um passing it myself was there any other comment yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make the comment that i i think um the the planning commission uh, really came down to debate of what size lot was the minimum size lot and my my um it, the discussion really revolved around whether to go for a half baker um, which i think would have got a majority of recommendation or 18,000 square feet, which is about 0.4 acres. So, you know, you know, it, while it was a it was a non recommendation for the ordinance as written, I think there is a majority of members on the planning commission that were in agreement of reducing it from four four acres down to somewhere around half an acre. And so, I mean, I think we're equivalent on exactly where where the line is. Um, and I'm comfortable with what's what's written here. I don't think the planning commission was the same, absolutely not change the existing ordinance. So that's why I'm comfortable with that. Um, and I do appreciate the commission's work and I always appreciate their recommendation. Um, in this case, I, I have to have a, basically what's a minor disagreement with, with, the, with what would have been the, the majority vote if we would have gone at a half an acre, so. Is there any other, anything wants to add? Okay, uh, does, is there any other questions? Does that answer your question, Mr. Collins? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yes. Okay, thank you. Is there any other comment or question from the public? With that, I'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. So, Madam Chair, with that, uh, we will close the record on the chicken ordinance, and that's the end of our ordinance hearings. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Freed. Uh, next up, I'll go to announcements before we have a time for public comments and questions about anything you wanna ask about. Um, so announcements, just a reminder, all meetings will be at the Township Building unless otherwise noted. Wednesdays here at 9.30 a.m. in Baird Park, there's a yoga class um, that is, given um, by a resident who is a certified yoga instructor and she donates her time, the, the yoga is free. So join, join us at 9.30 a.m. on Wednesdays. Uh, June 16th, the Environmental Advisory Council workshop meeting. Oh, wait, was it canceled? Did we hear if it was? Okay, we'll post the status of that meeting, but it's, it's scheduled for 7 p.m., but look at the website in case uh, there's a last minute cancellation. Uh, June 20th, Juneteenth will be observed here at the township. Uh, it's a new township holiday this year and township offices will be closed. June 21st, Community Day Committee will have their meeting at 7 p.m. here. Again, uh, they're all open to the public, these meetings. Uh, June 24th, there will be a Juneteenth presentation by the Historical Commission here at 7 p.m. Uh, July 4th is our Independence Day holiday and township offices will be closed that day. July, did I say June 4th? July, I was July 4th. Uh, July 6th, the Planning Commission will meet at 7.30 p.m. July 11th, the Board of Supervisors will meet again here at 7.30 p.m. And we're just an uh, update for August. We will be rescheduling our Board of Supervisors meeting for August 15th. That was originally scheduled for August 8th. Um, so we rescheduled due to scheduling conflicts. So that will be on the 15th in August. Um, and that's it. I will now open up uh, the floor to the public for any questions or comments. Anyone have anything to say? <laughs> okay, with that, I will ask, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second.
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night and have a nice night, everybody.